Welcome to Africa to you. I'm Vivian Birchall, your host. My guest today is Mr. Lamin Savadogo, who is the president for Marison Energy Systems Corporation and the global ambassador for Edison Electric Institute International. We will be chatting about the trends of the energy sector in the world, the United States, and the current state of electricity sector in Africa. The challenges, opportunities, and competitive forces at play in the U.S. engagement in the electricity sector in Africa, as well as the potential for the diaspora contribution. Mr. Lamine, welcome to Africa to you. Thank you very much, Vivian. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here. And before, before I ask any questions, how long have, what do you do? How long have you worked in the energy sector? First of all, I am not even an engineer, <laughs> but <laughs> I just found myself uh, in the sector by necessity. Uh, I, uh, my company was uh, founded in 1990, uh, more specifically December 15th, 1990. For the first few years, we did work in a number of sectors before coming to 1994, which is when we began our work in the electric power sector in Africa. Essentially what uh, we do is we are a company specializing in inter intermediation uh, between the United States and Africa. It's a role that I found myself uh, in the old days when I came here. There was very little knowledge about Africa. Um, I had come, uh, found myself sometimes people challenging is Mali really a country, which is the country <laughs> where I'm from? But in those days, there was no internet, there was nothing. So there was a, a lot, there was not much knowledge about Africa. So uh, I like to say since day one, I started this thing to try to intermediate and uh, help Africans understand the United States and help the United States understand Africa. So I did this in the government sector because I worked for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in uh, trade promotion. I also did some teaching. I uh, taught Bambara language at uh, Boston University's African Study Center for about six years. I also taught the same Bambara language at uh, Harvard University for about two years. So wow. I've done... Uh, 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 government, I've done academia, and then now I am doing business full-time in the electric power sector. So we have our clients uh, are two types. We have clients on this side, which could be uh, cor the corporate sector or could be government sector agencies or multilateral agencies. And on the African side, we have African entities, and now uh, specifically electric power companies in Africa. We help our American corporations develop the strategies and find, uh, sort of guide them to do business in Africa because it's a complex system, you know, because we know both sides, uh, we are able to do the intermediation. And uh, for our African clients, we also help them in finding specific solutions to their problems, solutions that can be adapted to the constraints of the operational uh, environment. Uh, oh, that's interesting. So have you done any business with the U.S. government itself? Yeah, I have. Uh, in fact, uh, our first foray into this power sector in 1994 when uh, a, US trade, uh, a U.S. government agency called the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, which is based in Virginia, uh, gave us a contract to organize a meeting between African electric utility executives and the corporate sector in Africa. So I, our company organized all the meetings, selecting the, the selected the participants in Africa, selected the participants here. And in fact, it was in the preparation of that, vis that mission that I understood the problems that they were uh, people were encountering in Africa mm -hmm. and some of the solutions that were available here that uh, people in Africa were not aware of. And uh, hold that thought because at some point I'm going to get back to the problems, the solutions, the collaborations. But first, from your experience, mm -hmm. what can you tell us about the trends of the energy sector in the world? Okay, the energy sector and more specifically the electricity sector, which is where I operate, um, we have 
uh, now the the uh, it, the sector is in transition. Uh, I'm sure everybody has heard about the UN Climate Conference uh, when we have been talking about issues such as uh, the carbon emission and, and things like that. So we have the three Ds in the power sector, decarbonization, mm -hmm. digitalization, and distributed energy. Decarbonization, uh, there is a lot of pressure from the public at large to stop burning fossil fuels to generate electricity. Right. Uh, and digitalization is now, you know, with digital systems, the electric power sector has been around for a long time, and the digitalization is allowing the different components of the systems to be able to communicate so that you are able to do a little bit more co coordination now right. that you could do before. And um, the issue of uh, uh, distributed generation is like to try to move from the large central power plant that you build somewhere and then you wheel the electricity to the consumption centers. So that you have distributed generation. As I was driving here, I saw a lot of solar panels on people's rooftops. Yes. And that is a little bit of uh, 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 distributed generation. So some of those people who have uh, solar panels on their houses are able to sell the electricity that they don't consume to the power so that it can go back into the grid. And right. what allows that is this issue of digitalization. So there is a central facility called New England. Uh, there is an independent system operator which actually looks at all the power generation facilities in right. the area mm -hmm. and is able to say, okay, you are cheaper at this time. I'm going to take you and dispatch you. So that independent system operator is now able to see every power generation facility available in a specific territory. Right. So, so you have kind of moved, looped into the United States energy sector, which is fine. Mm -hmm. So since we live in Massachusetts, I know that we're also connected to the uh, Canadian grid. Mm -hmm. uh, can you elaborate more about that and how that works? Okay. So before I do that, I, I'd like <laughs> to take a, a step back okay. a little bit uh, to talk about this electricity, this magic that we see every day that we actually take for granted, yeah. without which so much of the modern comforts that we have today would not happen. You told me that you had eggs for breakfast, <laughs> so the egg from the farm, where oh, that yeah. egg was produced, where it was hatched, every process involves electricity. Uh, we will not be able to do anything today in the United States without electricity. In fact, there was uh, uh, sometimes uh, there is a simulation uh, to figure out what would happen if there is an attack on the grid and the system fell. Everything will stop. You will not be able to get money from the bank. You will not be able to get into some buildings. No gas. You cannot buy gas. Uh, our life as we know it will stop. So it all started back in the 16th century. Uh, and by consensus, and there is a little bit of dispute on this, the person who first observed the phenomenon of electricity was Benjamin Franklin, okay. one of the uh, founding fathers of uh, uh, the country, he was uh, one of the people who wrote the Constitution, he was also a big inventor, and he was born here in Boston, downtown Boston on Milk Street. So, but he moved to Philadelphia where he Ex he did his famous experiment with a kite during a storm, which is when he first uh, discovered, observed, I would say, the phenomenon of electricity. Yeah. And since then, many people worked to get it to the point where it is today, where it is, uh, according to the National Academy of Engineering, which is one of the most prestigious uh, association, technical associations in the country, back in 2000, they decided to do a study and figure out the invention that was the most consequential in the 20th century. Right. By and large, the consensus was electrification. A lot of other people uh, were involved, uh, uh, namely Thomas Alva Edison, uh, who was the inventor of the incandescent light, which is the ancestor of all the lights that we see today. And that was really a turning point. 
okay. because uh, before that point, when uh, night fell, even here in the United States, it was darkness. We first uh, use people first use uh, well oil. Uh, in fact, uh, Massachusetts, uh, particularly uh, Nantucket and New Bedford, where, as you probably know, big centers for whale uh, hunting for whales. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they obtain, f harvested from the well was the oil that they used to, uh, in the lamps. So you had that. And then uh, later it turned into kerosene when oil was discovered right. and uh, became a major source of energy. Right. So it, it m moved to hydropower. You know, one of the big first big power plants was a plant built uh, Niagara in Niagara, New York, to produce electricity from power. Mm -hmm. As you know, windmills have been used forever. You right. know, and so today, I would say most of our electricity uh, partly comes from coal, but coal has been declining, yeah. and uh, natural gas, which has been increasing, hydropower, uh, nuclear energy and increasingly in renewable energy sources such as uh, solar and wind. All those are increasing as part of uh, you know, the move that I was uh, describing earlier, yeah. decarbonization. Mm -hmm. yeah. From your experience, mm -hmm. what are the trends of the energy sector uh, and the relationship between energy and urbanization, energy and health, energy and um, and transportation mm -hmm. and other critical sectors in the okay. economy. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I like to say this, and that's not because I work, just because I work in the electric power sector, but a consensus is emerging that the future of energy is electricity. So we will take other sources and transform them into electricity to do what we do. So. That brings us to the issue of uh, e-mobility, which is uh, the, trans uh, the electrification of the transportation sector, as we have seen in uh, electric cars, hybrid cars, electric trucks, electric buses that are coming into the market. So uh, the experts predict that in the future, and automobile manufacturers agree with this, they are all moving from the combustion engine to electric uh, uh, engines. So yeah. in the future, there will be a lot of uh, electric cars on the road. They are already testing electric uh, trucks and buses um, so that we will be moving with, uh, uh, within those kinds of things. The only sector that is sort of not yet well uh, integrated to that issue, uh, that uh, trend, is um, the maritime transportation, which, oh, yeah. uh, as you know, the ships are functioning primarily with diesel engines. And there is a lot of uh, movement of ships around the world. So that sector yet has yet to be uh, much concerned with this trend in the, tra uh, the uh, electrification of the transportation sector. So, so when you talk about the trends in transportation, mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, working for a municipal government, I, I, I think local, and I'm like, how is that influencing the uh, transportation at a, ver at a municipal level or even at a state level in terms of future planning mm -hmm. and not, not planning for today but if we're coming up with plans for 10 years, 20 mm -hmm. years, long, long term plans, what should we be looking out for? Uh, what should any community be looking out for? Okay, as in many of the states, there are some states that are more aggressive than others like California Right. is one of the uh, leaders in this whole issue of decarbonization, uh, the electrification of the transportation sector. So you will start probably by if your, uh, your town has a fleet of cars, you're likely to go and buy electric cars or hybrid cars as opposed to uh, uh, gasoline-fueled uh, cars. Right. And the town also probably through uh, some regulatory thing would have to have charging stations. So people can charge their cars at home, but you would need, if you are not home and you are out, just like you run out of gas, you go to a gas station. So there's got to be some charging stations around the, around the, uh, the city. Our town has one. Okay. I'm proud I, of it. All right. So <laughs> I think you will probably need to expand that to uh, places where people go, the malls, uh, 
probably the school, you know, your school buses also may need to be uh, electrified as we will go along. So the city probably through its zoning laws would have to be able to accommodate the need for more uh, charging stations uh, as uh, uh, more, more and more cars, more and more electric cars uh, uh, on the road. Uh, so thanks for that insight about, you know, the relationship between uh, the energy sector and transportation sector. And now, of course, I'm going to ask for more insight about the relationship between the energy sector and uh, urbanization in general and uh, the health sector, because the health sector is one of the very challenging sectors in this country and in the world. So what do you have to say? Okay. Well, uh, urbanization, which is a global trend, more and more people are moving to the cities. And I think uh, it is predicted by in, a, uh, in about 10 years, 15 years, there will be more people living in the cities than in the rural areas. And that creates a lot of challenges if we're going to go uh, use sources like solar energy, because here in Acton, you have a lot of star, um, space, you have a lot of single uh, family homes uh, and uh, with rooftops where you could uh, put the uh, uh, solar panels to power your house. Right. But if you move to downtown Boston where the city is much more vertical, then you're going to run into a problem of finding the space where to put those solar panels. So you have to find a space somewhere where you could uh, uh, install uh, the solar panels and then transport the electricity to the urban centers, which creates its own problems because as you know now, if you want to anywhere in this country or here specifically in Massachusetts, you want to build new transmission lines, nobody wants them to go through their town. <laughs> okay, not in my backyard. Back, yeah. yeah, so <laughs> that, that's one of the big issues. And also if you have to have uh, solar farms, they take space. Yeah. Again, a lot of uh, uh, communities do not want to see them in their state, in their area, uh, which creates a lot of problems. And one problem that we are probably uh, going to see more of probably in about 20, 25 years, because these uh, solar panels have a life cycle after which they have to be disposed of or recycled. Mm -hmm. Some of them have uh, uh, substances that are not specifically environmentally friendly. And in the uh, wind, uh, for instance, the wind, wind sector, we know that there are plans to build wind farms off the coast of uh, Massachusetts. The carbon fibers that are used to make those wind turbines, to make them resistant, are, very, are not biodegradable. Oh. And so when it times comes to uh, when they run through their life cycle, we have to dispose of them. That's another issue that we have to think about. But in the urban sectors, we have to find creative ways. You know, you can put so many solar panels on the top of a Prudential Tower <laughs> or the John Hancock. Uh, so there may be some uh, materials used to make buildings that may be able to absorb the sun's light and produce some electricity. To, for use in the in the area, uh, you talked about uh, the healthcare center, and we'll come a little bit more, talk a little bit more about that when we come to Africa. Here we are, we are lucky. There is electricity available 24 hours a day. The system is resilient. Uh, even if it fails, you have backup systems that work uh, very well. Without electricity, if you think about the last time you went to see a doctor. You know, all the things that are there, the well-lit rooms, uh, yeah. um, uh, how they take your blood pressure, how quickly when they take your blood they could uh, process them, all of this is uh, electricity dependent. And how do you dispose of waste and all of these things? So how to keep uh, the patients comfortable in the hospitals? The baby is somewhere in some hospitals here. You have a prematurely baby born, a born baby who is growing comfortably in an incubator, yeah. which is powered by electricity. Without it, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the medical sector will not be what it is. We have vaccines that are being refrigerated all the time. Mm -hmm. And if you have a breakdown in the electricity system, all of this will be spoiled. And right. that has consequences. 
before I dig deeper into the health mm. um, sector, especially in Africa, we'll mm. be talking about that uh, later, but um, you, t you mentioned uh, being powered by solar and renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And I have seen uh, questions mm -hmm. uh, from experts asking whether it's possible to, for the world to be powered by renewable energy. What are your thoughts with that? It's, uh, <laughs> it's a very good question. Uh, the pressure is certainly there from environmentalists. Some people believe that it's possible. I have heard one expert say that uh, if we want to power the world and get rid of uh, fossil fuel, in which when uh, nuclear power plant, coal and natural gas power plants, then we'd have to take the entire surface of uh, Russia. Russia, I've heard. You know, <laughs> and uh, cover that with solar panels. And then we're not even talking about how do you get that power to where it is. And then the sun doesn't shine every day. And even if there is sun, there are clouds. So that's why they call these sources of energy, uh, wind and solar, intermittent. You know, so uh -huh. so then, and, and the electric power system is uh, built such that what you produce has to be consumed almost immediately. Yep. Now, one of the trends I f forgot to mention is energy storage, mm. which is another interesting uh, trend, because to have this system work, you have to be able to capture the sun's energy during the day and store it in some kind of storage uh, facility, a battery or something like that, so that at night you can use that power. So or on cloudy days, and particularly for us in New England here, when sometimes the, the sun's rays are not as uh, intense as some other times of the day. Uh, during the summer, we have more sunlight yeah. than in the winter. I guess uh, today the sun is going to set about, set about 427 p.m. Oh, wow. So okay. you, you <laughs> see uh, the challenges that uh, we have. Wind also has the same issue. It doesn't blow all the time. Yep. Sometimes it blows, sometimes it doesn't. It, sometimes it blows with more intensity, sometimes it doesn't. So the same issue. And then you see those wind turbines. If you walk around them, I drove through a, a wind farm in, uh, uh, near uh, Palm Springs in uh, California. Giant, these are giant machines. So you have to be able to place them somewhere. And you know the Cape uh, Wind Farm project met a lot of resistance because those uh, uh, big turbines tend to uh, kill birds oh, yeah. during the migratory oh, <laughs> uh, yes, season, yes, yes. Yeah. and they create all kinds of friends. So uh, I am a I, I am a, f a friend of birds. So I worry about them uh, being you know harmed during uh, when these wind uh, turbines are turning around. So. It's a technology that is evolving. Mm. Uh, what the sonar panels, uh, the sonar panels can do today, they were not able to do 10 years ago. Uh, the costs keep going down because it was very, very expensive technology. So we are hopeful that that technological innovation will continue so that renewable energy will continue to play their role. Now, we have to also notice that oil Okay, oil is not, in, you know, we, I think there is, uh, people are looking at a time when there will not be enough oil. The world's population is growing. Mm -hmm. So if we continue to co consume oil at this rate, there will not be enough. Uh, in uh, February, I was in uh, Kuwait uh, participating in a, a, you know, sort of doing what we're talking about energy diplomacy uh, <laughs> with a Gulf Corporation Council, which uh, are the six states in the Arabian Gulf, all of them very rich in uh, oil and gas resources. They are all preparing for a time when there will be no more oil. Wow, it's interesting that they are actually cognizant of that potential problem and uh, trying to do something, do something about, about, it. about it. And in Saudi Arabia, the biggest oil producer, is uh, going solar. They are thinking of uh, selling part of the national oil company, Aramco, to diversify the e economy from the oil sector. 
So there will not be enough oil for all of us. We have to start thinking about other things, and that's where these new renewable sources, uh, the renewable sources, sun and wind, they've always been with us. The sun, as far as we know, since the creation of the universe, has always been shining. Could that be the reason why Morocco has the, the biggest plant, uh, solar plant, I think, in the world? Yes. Uh, they have uh, built this uh, uh, called Desert Tech yes. in the desert in Morocco. They, because they don't have uh, much in terms of indigenous energy resources, the country has, that with, uh, has had a forward-thinking policy. Uh, so they have this uh, huge... Uh, uh, solar farm there using uh, uh, concentrated photovoltaic. I think people are warning us that we shouldn't put all our eggs in one, one basket. Egg. Yeah. And the other issue is that the United States is industrialized, so that we are in a post-industrial um, economy, as are most countries in Europe. But Africa, if we we'll talk about that, in places like in Morocco, still need the big central power plants that can generate electricity to process bauxite into aluminum, to process manganese into steel. You know, you really need, so far we have not been able to see uh, renewable energies outside of hydro, which is a renewable energy, most people forget. Um, have been, you cannot use solar to to process minerals. You right. have to have either natural gas or coal. And this or is nuclear. Yeah, nuclear, which <laughs> is uh, another, uh, which is, by the way, the most efficient uh, form of electricity production, uh, nuclear energy, uh, and very, very limited uh, uh, emission. But the problem is what do you do with uh, the spent fuel? How oh, yeah. do you uh, uh, dispose of uh, the waste that comes out of uh, uh, nuclear power plants? Through your experience in the mm -hmm. energy sector, mm -hmm. what would you say the energy sector is organized in the United States? Okay. So again, I'd like to point out electric. Electric. <laughs> electric <laughs> energy sector. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, the electric energy sector, uh, you know, is uh, in terms of uh, ownership. Let's talk about that. Uh, I would say about two-thirds of the power generation capacity is owned by what is called invested-owned utilities, which means they are privately owned. Uh, you also have uh, some power plants that are owned by the federal government. Okay. We have a Bonneville Power Authority. We have a t the Tennessee Valley Authority, some that are owned by states and some that are owned by municipalities. Oh. So that's okay. in the generation side. Now... On the distribution side, you know, the grids are interconnected. Mm. So the country is divided into three zones. You have the eastern interconnection, which is pretty much all the states in the eastern seaboard. Uh, you have the western interconnection, which all the states in the west, western part of the country. It goes inland, both east-west. And then you have the Texas interconnection, which is an interconnection in its own. So within each one of these interconnections, you have uh, different utilities that serve different uh, territories, and you have um, about nine independent systems operators. Those are the ones who actually decide which power plant to call to dispatch at which time. Mm -hmm. the, uh, at the top of all of this, you have the federal government. Uh, which is actually, because this is such a critical infrastructure, it has to be protected. Yes. You know, so the federal government has a regulatory commission which makes sure that the system is safe and regulates all interstate exchange of electricity. Uh, the states are responsible for what happens within their state. Uh, we are connected also here to Canada. Yes. We get electricity from Hydro-Quebec. That's all renewable, clean hydropower hydro. yeah, that we get from there. Right. And on the uh, western side, they are also uh, connected to the Canadian grid. And uh, down south, Texas has a small connection with Baja, uh, California. Uh, so 
we have this, uh, um, uh, the system is very, very well organized. Uh, the investor-owned utilities are members of this organization called the Edison Electric Institute, for which I am a global ambassador. Yes. Uh, to, uh, they account for about, well, as I was saying, two-thirds of the installed capacity in this country and supply energy, energy uh, electricity to about 220 million people in all the 50 states plus the District of Columbia. Okay. So it's a, a, a group that gets together, that talks about issues affecting the industry and make sure that the grid, grid uh, remains resilient. And part of the uh, Institute's mission is also to make sure that people around the world benefit, can get the benefit of electrification. That's where my work as a global ambassador trying to bring that to Africa uh, comes in. Uh, it's interesting you talk about the interconnectivity. How susceptible is such a power grid to hackers and disruption? Okay, a very good question. Because with uh, digitalization, uh, effectively, like every sector now, cyber attacks are a threat. Mm -hmm. And the grid is certainly subject to those threats. But I can um, assure your viewers and the public at large that there is a lot of work that the electric utilities and the federal government and the state governments are doing to make sure that the grid remains safe and resilient. And there is a uh, next year, the Edison Electric Institute's member collectively are going to invest about eight hundred billion dollars in trying to make sure that the grid is secure that we are constantly watching for these attacks that can be domestic and that can also come from other uh, other countries right. you know so the the threat is there but because the of the critical nature of the electric grid a lot of work is at uh, is going on the other issue is natural disasters as yes. we see them mm -hmm. you know storms and we we watch them here in new england when we have uh, snowstorms and things like that those are things that we can plan for but we cannot always we can't always those are not man-made right. those are you know so those uh, kinds of threats exist as you saw with the fires in california um, that uh, created a lot of problems for the uh, distribution grid over there. And did that affect Texas? Because uh, no, always that Texas is, is a, because the way the grid is built is that you have a way of doing what they call islanding, mm -hmm. so that if there is a specific portion that has a problem, you can cut that off from the system and route the power in a Excellent. different way. Yeah. So that is, a, of course, a, a detail that many of us don't know. We take it for granted of, oftentimes that, okay, there is, you turn on the switch and the light is on, yeah. you turn on the gas and uh, you can cook. So it's always, um, it is a humbling experience learning the detail of how the electricity is distributed. Mm -hmm. And um, the interconnectivity, it's amazing to learn the connection, for example, of the New England uh, grid to Quebec, Quebec yeah. mm -hmm. um, and how they share the electricity. Mm -hmm. So um, what else would you want to share with us regarding um, the structure internationally? Do what? we export, for example, does besides um, sharing a grid with uh, Canada, does the U.S. export electricity or does it import electricity from other neighbors? Yeah, well, yeah, this, uh, well, the U.S. is a largely... Um, you know, I would say self-sufficient yes. uh, in electricity because of geographic issues. The only other countries we can trade with will be Canada yeah. and uh, Mexico. And even if people uh, thought about it, maybe with uh, some great uh, transmission lines, you could uh, connect all the way down to uh, Central America. But w the issue with power is also the longer the distance, uh, the more power you lose in oh. the transmission process. So, uh, and now we are trying to move towards, as I was saying earlier, distributed generation, which means that you create the power plant next to where it's going to be used. Mm. You know, that's, yeah. But 
the country is, of course, involved in uh, exporting a lot of technology, mm -hmm. a lot of equipment. Uh, General Electric, which is headquartered here now in Boston, is a leading exporter of uh, gas turbines and all kinds of uh, uh, all kinds of equipment that is used in uh, power uh, production, transmission, and distribution. We have several other companies, big and small, in the area that are involved. And uh, uh, another important thing is um, uh, how the educational institutions, such as MIT, that are uh, involved in research and development. Yeah. A lot of research and development is being done at MIT in renewable energy, in storage technology, in decarbonization. Uh, they are always have, it's a very interesting thing, most of their seminars are open to the public. I think they should go and listen to what work is doing here so that every time you pass in front of 77 Massachusetts Avenue, you know that there are people at work to try to make sure to foresee the next generation of technologies that will continue to make our lives easier, more comfortable, uh, by not uh, also degrading our environment too much. So it's interesting that uh, you mentioned there was a recurring theme in uh, your conversation about U.S. being self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. And so I know that there are many um, energy companies mm -hmm. in the United States. Since there is no more demand in the U.S., how are the companies working with the other countries that desperately need the service? Okay, so, uh, you know, again, it's electricity. Electricity. We are, yeah, we have <laughs> about the installed capacity in the United States is about 1 million megawatts which is a gigantic amount, given that we consume a lot. If you look at all the buildings, the elevators, the transportation. Uh, yeah, even now when you go to, uh, to the bathroom, your faucet uh, is automatic, uh, you know, oh, the, so the, the, the soap dispenser, all of that is powered by electricity. But you, you see also, because of this concern for the environment, there has also been a lot of thought paid to the notion of energy efficiencies, mm. which is that we have light bulbs now that consume no less electricity. So if you go to, uh, to buy, you want to buy a new thing, you will find that your light uh, bulbs, not only do they give you more light, but they also consume less electricity and last a longer time. And washing machines and dryers. Exactly. And energy efficiency yeah. has been going on for a long time, which, has, which means that the, the demand, although the, the demand may be increasing, because you have all these efficiencies, you don't see a huge increase. Like you will see in a country where people didn't have washing machines before. Now they have washing machines, they have refrigerators and things like that. So the U.S. remain involved in the, with the rest of the world in trying to make sure that we, you know, because if the rest of the world is uh, deficient in the system, it affects you too. Sort of, it's not, uh, you cannot just focus on what you do uh, locally. So you have to have this, uh, um, this global view. That's why at the State Department, there is an office called the Office of Energy Resources, which tries to work with the other countries in the world to secure enough energy supply for all of us. And you've worked with the State Department office? Yes, so uh, in one of their programs uh, uh, recently, uh, uh, they asked me to go to the Republic of Congo uh, to discuss uh, with uh, various stakeholders there, some of the development that are happening here in the US and how those, some of them may, could be used in their specific context to help them uh, deal with a very, very, very challenging uh, power sector, uh, power situation in the country, which is more or less the same thing in mm. all the Africa. African countries. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, maybe I need to, at this point, get into the motherland, okay. the heart of Africa. We are struggling with electricity. And uh, we, I mean, we're fortunate that we have um, the Department of State uh, willing to work with many countries in Africa, so either through bilateral relations or even uh, multilateral relations. 
or even at the African Union level, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. So what is the problem? What, is the cha what are the challenges in Africa in the electricity sector? How much time do we have? <laughs> 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 yeah, the, the challenges are many. They are complex. Uh, there are technical issues. There are political issues. There are govern governance issues. There are also cultural issues that are involved uh, more than 50 years after most uh, African countries as independence, you will find that uh, totally people estimate that there are 650 million people in Africa who don't have access to electricity. And the consequences of that are just tremendous. You know, you were talking about the healthcare sector before. Yeah. Uh, about 60% of the healthcare facilities in Africa don't have ac access to reliable electricity. Th that tells you, it goes to tell you the vaccines that are not refrigerated, uh, uh, the times when uh, you are doing a uh, you are doing a surgery that the power may uh, be cut, and then you have to have a backup diesel generator. Uh, it, it, the consequences are just uh, tremendous. So it also means that in the development of a continent, we don't have many manufacturing companies because to manufacture you need electricity. Okay, so if you don't have manufacturing, manufacturing jobs tend to be higher quality and pay more. So Africa is finding itself with all its vast mineral resources that are being exported without being processed. They are not processed because investors say there is no electricity. So in my own country of origin, Mali, uh, we are the second producer of cotton in Africa. Uh, only 1% of that cotton is processed locally. That is sad. 1% to 2% maximum. The rest is exported and turned into clothes that are imported back that we, we buy. So every time I see those bales of cotton uh, on trucks going out, I see jobs for young people, the jobs that are going. You go to Central Africa where they cut forestry resources. They t cut the trees and then they put them on trucks or float them down the river, take them, put them on boats and take them somewhere. They could have been processed locally. You know, you could have uh, uh, sawmills, you could uh, uh, make furniture and all of those things if electricity existed, you see. Um, we produce bauxite. 50% of the bauxite which turns into aluminum comes from Africa, but very minimal processing in Africa. Mm -hmm. So again, that's jobs, that's expertise, that's all kinds of things that go outside of a continent. So the problems are many, and the, the, the paradox is that there are plenty of energy resources in Africa, yep. plenty of hydropower, natural gas, of course we have sun, and in some parts of the continent you have wind, and in Eastern Africa you have geothermal sources, uh, but still our sector, electric power sector, uh, it remains undeveloped. Why? <laughs> As I was saying, because uh, we have all these resources, for, yeah. Uh, why it's, is it not being developed? It's uh, it's it's vision, it's governments governance, it's prioritization, prioritization, it's all of those things. It's political. All of those things combined, because if you take um, uh, the countries uh, that are in the Central Africa in the Congo River Basin. Okay, where they have vast hydro power potential. Okay? If thought was given, if we started thinking okay, clearly, because people, when you look at hydro power plants, people look at huge plants that take a long time to build. There is this massive dam that they've been thinking about building called the Inga Dam which is a huge infrastructure if they ever built it, okay? So rather than focusing on something big like that, you have micro-hydro um, technology. 
that you could implement on the banks of a river, okay? Mm. So that when people fish, then they have a possibility to refrigerate the fish. Uh, they have access to the forestry resources around them that they are cutting and exporting without processing. Some of that can be processed. Uh, the minerals that are going around, that are being exported without being processed, some of that can be done. And that technology, microhydro technology, has existed for a long time. The choices are not always made with um, access to the relevant information. I would say one of the things that I, I really uh, insist on is for the Africans themselves to learn how to plan and develop the power systems. So we, we've come to a point uh, where the world has actually decided that, uh, has understood that Africa will not develop without electricity. So the African Development Bank, which is the premier development financing institution in Africa, has top, put uh, electricity at the top of their priority because that's the way they're going to support industrialization on the continent. If you look at the World Bank's programs, uh, the European Union, the United States, uh, individual countries, uh, uh, China, uh, Germany, all of them actually have a, a renewed focus on the electricity sector. Just uh, last week, the Chinese convened a big meeting in Beijing where over a thousand people participated to try to connect the world uh, electricity globally. So. We are happy to see that, and uh, I just don't want the diaspora uh, to be left out. Uh, in uh, the Africa, the American investment community, also, I would like them to know that there is an opportunity for them to try to uh, get involved in this. Uh, it's a very lucrative uh, sector, uh, which does a lot of good for the well-being of people. If the U.S. or the World Bank or the European Union mm -hmm. or Denmark sends a, an expert, that expert may come with certainly some technological expertise. But what is even more important is the local knowledge. How do you take that technology and implement it? Because it's actually the people there who will have to operate it. Right. So you don't, you don't want to just uh, bring the technology, plant it there, and go. And every time there is a problem, they call you to come back and fix it. That right. doesn't work. So you have to develop a local expertise and transfer and technology. Local yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, it's a, that's a paramount uh, in the sector. That is not happening. If I wanted to invest in the electricity sector in Africa, mm -hmm. what would I be looking for? Or what are some of the guidelines you would Give. Okay, yeah. Okay, the the dark. I just I flew back from Brazzaville to Paris uh, last Saturday, and it was a night flight, and I was looking down. It was, you know, as pitch dark. You see a few points here and there, and then once you get closer to the Mediterranean coast, you see the northern African area. There is <laughs> a, once you cross the Mediterranean. It's really light everywhere, and, and, and that makes it, you know. So I investing in the power sector, uh, particularly thinking about the diaspora. Yes. Uh, this issue of distributed generation is an opportunity that the diaspora should be looking into because we are not talking about huge investments anymore. Mm. We're talking about distributed generation and a microgrid let's say in an economic area that is sustainable, where there are natural, some resources that need to be processed, this is where the diaspora could invest. Because uh, about uh, three years ago, we had uh, a conference on uh, what to do with, how to better utilize remittances. Yes. Okay? <laughs> so I, I just said to myself, at the time, it was about, I don't remember, about, about 65 or $70 billion a year that collectively the African diaspora sends home. About 80% of that is used for food and different things. But I said, if we were able to, to take 5% of that, okay, 
and say we're going to take a, fi a five year period, each one of us, whatever we are sending to our families, if you're sending a hundred dollars, you take five dollars and you put that aside, okay, and we do that for five years. At the end of the five years, we have a certain amount of money and the rest is leveraging because once you have a seed money, you can attract investment from other people. But that's on a large scale. It takes a lot of things to do. But individually, there is a very big Ugandan community here in Massachusetts. If that community were to get organized and try to study the Ugandan situation and figure out places where the grid has not yet gone, okay, yeah. and invest in a, a microgrid, a micro, you know, distributed generation microgrid. It could be solar. It could even be uh, diesel powered, as long as it's economically viable. The one thing I'd like to remind, uh, remind people of is electricity is business and it's profitable, because the Edison Electric Institute, okay, which is investor owned. Uh, if you look at you, me, our the viewers here. Anybody who has an, uh, a retirement account, in that the retirement account, most likely there is there are utility stocks, because those <laughs> stocks pay dividends regularly. Oh. Uh, particularly those who are retired, they provide dividends. They are they are stable, because the utility the uh, the electric tariffs are regulated. The government accepts to give them a monopoly over a certain area and uh, acknowledges that there is risk involved in uh, doing this business, mm -hmm. then they guarantee them a certain level of profitability. So utility, the utility, the electric utility business can be profitable. Yeah. For Africans who are thinking of retiring, okay, if you are not going to need some of the savings that you have, you can invest it in the electricity sector. Remember, power systems operate 24 hours a day. Yeah, but then a, what, the question would be, Yes. how do they jump through the loopholes of the government? Okay, a and this is where I think the diaspora's organization, okay, at a continental level could lobby the governments because we don't have a choice. You have to have electricity. Yep. Is Africa is going to develop? There is no if and or but. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, th what does that require? It requires the governments to create a safe and secure and stable regulatory environment, mm -hmm. so that I know that if I come, I'm going to invest. The investment is going to be amortized over 10, 15, 20 years. That I know that within that time the regulatory environment is stable and safe and I can do my business without interfering from the government. The other part of it, which is cultural, that the public, the people who are going to buy the electricity from, from me, have to stop thinking that they can get electricity without paying for it. <laughs> okay? W which is a big problem because you have illegal connections, you have all kinds of things. People, some, some people just don't think that they should pay electricity. So you have some utilities that are losing 50% of the, the power that they sell. They cannot recover the cost, you know, let alone the profits for about 50%. That cannot be viable. Yeah. So that means that uh, people involved or potentially involved have to have sort of have a way to engage with all the stakeholders. When you come to a village, you, everybody has to understand what's involved, how much it's going to cost, and why everybody needs to pay so that we can keep this public uh, good uh, for supporting the community and developing the cause. And you, you, you know this, in Africa, the lack of electricity actually adversely affects more women than men. Because yep. the women are the ones who have to, in Fetching the rural area, firewood. Yeah, <laughs> you know, to come and then they come to in the kitchen to cook with that firewood with all the smoke. 
uh, ironing, it, put it in the, put the exactly, iron, yeah, the, it, that it, steel thing. Yeah, <laughs> it affects your health because uh, we're not made to, to breathe those things. So um, we, we have to have a collective thing that is actually the comfort of uh, the children, you know, the newly born ones, so their vaccines and everything are kept safe. Uh, our mothers, our sisters, our wives, uh, their health is important, particularly in the rural areas. They are the, you know, they are the backbone of a society. So somebody told me that if uh, men were the ones who were going to fetch the firewood <laughs> or the water, <laughs> it, would <be> <laughs> it would be very different, you know. <laughs> and the same thing, the water system. Right. The water systems will be dependent on electricity. So if mm -hmm. you have water, you have a solar system, you can pump water from um, from the well. I, I, I saw some villages where the women have to pump for about 30 minutes before all the air that is into the power, uh, the pumping system can come out and they can get some water. You know, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of hard work. You know, the, as you, you mentioned all these challenges, I'm thinking back at, mm, I've been following a, a global health uh, program where mm -hmm. they're trying to uh, bridge healthcare disparities because of course they affect um, communities in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa a lot. And, um, you know, trying to find um, ways of improving healthcare. But what I'm hearing from you is that we also need to improve the energy sector for that to be sustainable. We need the infrastructure to to safely uh, store yeah. the medicines, mm -hmm. to to do the diagnosis, the imaging, and all that is required for uh, all the tests that are required. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is an a an area of collaboration so mm -hmm. i will be <laughs> looking out for the different players because if we're to make it work in africa we can't focus on just one issue mm -hmm. so uh, it gives me food for thought maybe i need to put you and uh, the people in the health sector together and we have one show to just talk about how to collaborate to make to well, build a whole ecosystem okay <laughs> we in the uh, electric power sector we like to think of our business as we are in the operating room with a doctor, right? Because <laughs> he cannot do his job without it. Right. We are in the classroom yeah. with the teachers. We are in the labs with the technicians. We are in the kitchen with, <laughs> with the, the, with the cook cooks. We are everywhere. Right. You know, we are, we are in airports. We, so the, the thing accompanies ev everybody in, yeah. in the work that they do. So we have to have that strategic relationship with all the sectors. Uh, the Edison Electric Institute, for which I am a global ambassador, contributes about 5% of the US GDP. 5%? 5%. And that the, is not first, a small yeah, the first 5%, because if collectively those utilities stop operating tomorrow, the economy will collapse. Absolutely, no factory, no f nothing. You're not going to be able. Well, you may be able to go and get some charcoal to fry your egg tomorrow morning, right. but then you have to go and look for the wood or <laughs> the coal or whatever to Which do. Which reduces productivity <laughs> in other exactly. areas. Exactly. Uh, we were going to talk about the U.S. engagement in Africa. The U.S. Uh, has been and is and continues and will be involved uh, in the power sector in Africa and. Uh, we hope that there will be more and more of it uh, because the United States certainly has a lot to offer in terms of technology, in terms of practices, in terms of examples to follow because the entire world come here, comes here to be inspired by what's happening because the electricity business started here. Yeah. The first power plant was the Pearl Street power plant that belonged to Thomas Alva Edison in New York. Right. So. Of course, everybody knows, other nations do know what to do, but the United States particularly has something to be able to offer to the African continent. So the, the, the Obama administration came up with this notion, this project called Power Africa, where they were going to um, add about 30,000 megawatts and connect, I guess, uh, something like 60 million people in the uh, grid. Uh, 30,000 is nothing. Yeah. J just the state of Texas has 126,000 
megawatts in ex uh, installed capacity. That's about 25 million people. Wow. Okay? <laughs> yeah. We are 1.2 billion. <laughs> With 30 megawatts. Yeah, so 30 megawatts, it's a good start, yeah. but it's, it's, it's just a drop in the bucket. Right. You know, and then you're going to connect the 60 million people yeah. out of 650 million. But if everybody did that, that's a good start yeah. because that also has a multiplier effect. Yeah. So Power Africa is still going. Uh, just uh, earlier this week, uh, the coordinator of the, uh, the whole effort actually issued uh, a report where he uh, talked about some of the uh, uh, mistakes that were made in the process. Because one of the big mistakes was that we're going to create 30,000 megawatts, but not much thought was given to, okay, how do we get it to uh, people? Oh. Transmission <laughs> and distribution. How do we do that? Right. So that, that not much thought was given to that. But now they are trying to correct uh, that system. So there are training programs that are involved, African delegations that come all the time. Uh, U.S. government funds feasibility studies for power systems um, across the continent. Uh, uh, there is an association called the UNE U.S. Energy Association, which engages electric utilities from Africa. They bring them here for training. Um, a lot of African students come to um, uh, universities here for training. I think there should be more of that happening. Why not uh, build the universities on the continent so that train the kids there? Yeah, that's another possibility. And now <laughs> with all the communication facilities, you can access, you can have a professor give a lecture from here to people, students in Africa. You know, and that part is extremely important, the training part, mm -hmm. the training component. People to, to be able to design the systems, to actually implement them, operate them, and fix them when there is a problem. Right. As long as you don't have that. And then that's how you start to innovate. Yeah, you know, true. but if those capabilities are not there, you know, it's gonna, the problem is going to continue. Well, uh, this has been an engaging conversation. It, it, um, it's a lot of food for thought. And I thank you for being here today for the insight into the electricity sector. You're welcome. <laughs> this time I'm being more, <laughs> more focused on electricity, not the energy, but well, it's all part of energy. But um, I hope to continue having these conversations with you in the future. And uh, do you have, before I sign, I sign us out, is there any final words you want our viewers to know about the electricity sector that we haven't uh, talked about? Well, first of all, I would like to thank you for really, uh, you know, uh, deciding to put, uh, to highlight the sector and its importance uh, through this uh, discussion. And, and I'd like to remind everybody that, uh, particularly the diaspora or anybody business that in Africa, we need what is called energy entrepreneurs, okay? And that those of us who live in a area, in an area like Boston, where there are so many uh, uh, institution of higher education providing insight into these sectors, people should take advantage of it yeah. uh, to right. learn. A uh, lot of lectures happens uh, every week. People should go and, and listen. For the public at general, uh, every time you go past uh, a, a utility truck, uh, somebody in the bucket trying to fix a light, or you know some people in manhole, just say hi to them <laughs> because they are doing something to keep you really comfortable. Don't interfere with their work, but just say hi. Thank you for keeping the lights on. Oh, that's some food for thought. I'll certainly try to do that. <laughs> Thank you again, Mr. Lamin, for coming to my show, and I look forward to continuing the conversations. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.